This is Shane Matthews interviewing Robert Campbell for the Library of Congress. Could you go ahead and tell me uh, your name and date of birth? I'm and Bob Campbell. I was born in Lynn, Massachusetts in 1917, June 25th. And what branch of the service did you say? I was service? in the Army. Uh, I'm an infantry. How did you actually start out? Did you choose to enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted while I was still in college in 1940, one of the first ones when the draft started. And then uh, when I got the notice to be drafted, I, I, after I got out of the Wentworth Institute, I went to work in Springfield, Vermont for Jones and Lanson Machine Company. In June, and I had been there about six weeks when I got my notice from the draft board. And what, they, went, what went through your head when you received that notice? Well, not too much. But, uh, I was young at the time, <laughs> and uh, the company tried to get me deferred because it was a, a government machine work, and uh, they said I hadn't been there long enough. I've been there six weeks. I understand. Now, what was the first day of your active duty service like? What had happened? Well, of course, I lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire at that time. And uh, at the time we got called up, there was a good number. It was probably 25 or 30 of us. And they took us down to the railroad station in Portsmouth. And the mayor was there and all the dignitaries. And we went to Manchester, New Hampshire for a physical exam. And uh, I, I think all of us passed but one. So this letter specifies that everyone to report has to be qualified for overseas service. Yeah, yeah. And as a result of your application to yeah, the airport... I wasn't qualified to go. But I was in charge of all the headquarters motor vehicles. And I had to load all those vehicles on the flat cars in in the old California. And I I put in for ten days leave at that time because I couldn't go with them. And when I had got those vehicles all loaded on the train for A P Hill, Virginia, I got on the train with them. And I went, went all across the country right to Chicago with them. I wasn't supposed to be on that train. And when they got into the freight yards in Chicago, I got my baggage and jumped off the train and went into the station and got a ticket to go to Boston. And they went, that's when they went to Africa. They went to AP Hill, Virginia and went to Africa. So where did your trip take you after you headed up to New England? I went back to California to the Air Corps. I went to pilot training in Santa Ana, California. Three of us. And in, in between that, well, after we filed our application for the Air Corps, uh, we were friendly with General Patton's aide, uh, uh, Captain Galloway. And General Patton had left them and gone to Washington. And we, we get uh, Jim Galloway to send a TWX to Washington to find out the status of our application for the Air Corps. What is the TWX? Well, it's like a teletype. And uh, Captain Galloway got a, a reply back for us to lay off we get our orders when they get ready for well, I think I got it that tell I like some place in there. Get down, be certain to get down another page whether the where I see it. Uh, it's, in the, it's in there someplace. Yeah, right there, I think. Is that it? Yeah. This is it here. 
and then as after your ten days of leave were over, then I went back to the Second Armored Corps, right in the same place. And then while I was there, I got orders to report to Hemet, California, to an, a base there for a physical exam. And this is where a lot of it goes on. So I went through for the physical, and I, everything checked fine till I got the eye exam. And uh, most of the eye exam I passed fine. And we got down to the end of it, and they had this big long box. I, I'd say it was probably 20 feet. And in the box, they had two blocks with ropes on them. You leave it, charge? Okay. With ropes on them. And you had to put four ropes to line up those blocks. So I, I went through that all right. And when I got through it, the sergeant showed me, took me down, showed me where the blocks lined up. I was about a foot off on the two blocks. So I said to him, can, can I do that again? And he said, yeah, he said, take a little rest and do it again. So I, I wrestled about a half an hour and did it again. And when I got to where I thought they lined up, I pulled them another foot and they lined up perfect. So, so I passed the exam. And uh, from there, I went to primary training. I don't recall just how long it lasted. And then I went to a uh, primary training school, the Rankin Academy, and that's a top photo up there on uh, Stevens. I graduated from there, and we went to basic training, which was uh, training in the uh, Walsy B-15, I think, at the time. And when we got to the end of that class, we had a Army checkout test with an Army pilot. And I made, made all the tests fine, and I come in for a landing. And they thought I was making a perfect landing. I'd be 10 feet off the ground. They made me do it three times, and I did the same thing. And that's where I failed. From that first test, I didn't have any depth perception. And to this day, I, I have the same troubles. Yeah. So when you were trying to land the plane, you would be still too high? Yeah, I think I'd be right, perfect, right on the, on the landing. And I'd be 10 feet off the ground and drop right in. And I did it three times, and that was the end of it. Yeah. What happened after they determined you couldn't? Well, I, at that time, I had about 130 hours put in, and I was assigned to what they call battle training. It was a new thing. It was out in the boondocks, and uh, it was training for warfare. And I was on really the first detail that went out there. I was in a medium tank, and we went through the woods, and I got hit by a tree branch. I was up in the turret. And uh, a couple of days later, I had a lame back and I reported a sick call and ended up in the hospital. And Why I did you wait a couple of days? Huh? Why did you well, wait Well, I didn't think it was that serious. And uh, well, I finally went to sick call and they sent me to the hospital. And I was in the hospital Pretty near a month. Now I'm trying to think. Of. After I got out of the hospital, I put in for leave. Uh, I'm trying to think it back. I put in a leave to get get married. My girlfriend back home. Uh, so we had planned to get married on June 5th and her uncle lived in Columbus, Georgia 
and he was a vice president of Royal Crown Cola. And he offered to have a, have a, a ferry down there in Georgia. Well, I was stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky. My wife was up in Massachusetts. So we ended up down in Columbus, Georgia, right outside of Fort Benning. And we were married, and then we went back to Fort Knox. And uh, I ended up in, in a basic training company at Fort Knox as executive officer. And at that time, basic training was 13 weeks. At the end of that 13 weeks, I took over the next group as company commander. And I still wanted a second lieutenant. And I couldn't get promoted. And I found out from a friend of mine in personnel that when they put my promotion in, it was turned down in Washington. And that's all from that business out in California. Really? Yeah. From that one dispute over whether you yeah. got back on time? Yeah. And I was I was a company commander in Fort Knox with 75,000 troops on base, and I was only company commander of the second lieutenant. What rank were the other company commanders? First lieutenants, captains, and the company I had, I had a good company. I got in that book, I got two or three commendations in there as a company commander. At the end of that 13 weeks, I was relieved as company commander was appointed battalion adjutant. And that lasted about two weeks when I got orders to go overseas. How did you and your wife take you receiving orders to go overseas? Uh, well, we knew it was coming. And uh, when I first got the orders, I had to report to Fort Meade, Maryland. And I was just reading in one of the letters of George Arena that I wrote home to my mother and father. Fort Meade, Fort Meade was the worst camp I'd ever been in. And then we get transferred from Fort Meade to, uh, I don't know what's this other camp? Camp Kil Kilmer in New Jersey. And we were there probably two or three weeks. And every other night, we got a pass to go to New York. My wife had come down to meet me. And I think it was uh, for June 5th, was, a, was our first year anniversary. And we were up on top of the Empire State Building. And I looked down in New York Harbor. There was one boat there. And I told her, I said, well, it looks like we're not going. Next day we went on the Queen Mary tea day. And we went from the on the Queen Mary, went all the way down to the Azores, and back up to Scotland, zigzagging, 45 degrees. Why did the ship take 45 degree angles? To dodge the submarines, German subs. And we never saw a boat all, all the way up. And we got into Scotland. As a matter of fact, on that Queen Mary, there was one whole division on it. And 500 of us second lieutenants going over to replacements. We ended up, landed up in Scotland, up in Glasgow. We took a train, went down into England. I think the first town we went in was Wells, which is a little country town. Stayed there, oh, probably a week or two and then moved to Glastonbury in England. What was particularly notable about Glastonbury? Well, it was a nice little town. And uh, we weren't there too long. As I say, the main thing I remember is that Glastonbury Abbey. But I walked, was right in the center of town. And I walked down there and gone all through it. 
And then uh, from there, then we we got orders to move down to Southampton and went across the channel. And I went across just 30 days after D-Day. What were you hearing in England about D-Day, about what was going on in the beach? Uh, not too much. We used to, when we were down to Southampton, oh, only a couple of days before we shipped out, we could hear those buzz bombs go overhead, the German rockets going overhead. But, uh, but back then, of course we were young, and, and nothing bothered us. We knew where we, were, where we were going, and we just went. So then we got over to France, and we went to a couple, without, mostly out in the country, in small towns. And, As I say, with the, we were all replacements, and every day they call three or four here to go to this armored division of this tank battalion. Because we're all armored officers, and I was sitting around there, and there was only four or five of us left, and we were sitting up in the field one day playing cards in the afternoon. There was nothing else to do, and the sergeant came up and he said, Lieutenant Campbell. Get your bags ready and be in front of the office headquarters at 8.30 tomorrow morning. There'll be somebody here to pick you up. So I got all ready and I'm down there at 8.30 in the morning. Here comes this staff car up. What was going through your head right after the sergeant told you you were going somewhere? Uh, not too much. I knew I was going to go someplace. And, uh, boy, I, I'll tell you a little story before that. Uh, We had been over there not not too long in France, and I heard rumors that General Patton was taking over Third Army. And uh, they were headquarters, well, they, I don't know how far they were, but it was probably 30, 40 miles. So one Sunday I hitched a ride down to the headquarters to see if I knew any of the, the officers that had been out in California with me. And I asked for this one and that one. And the only one I come up with was the Captain Manane. Well, he and I were second lieutenants out in California together. He was company supply house, I think. Well, he ended up, his aide to General Gay, which it was Patton's chief of staff. So we talked for a while, and he asked me where I was, and I told him I was up in this replacement battalion. And he said, well, if I get a chance, I'll come up and see you. Well, I guess oh, a week or two went by and nothing happened. And as I say, that day the sergeant came up and told me to be ready to go. This staff car came up with a major sitting in the back end. He said, get in. And I got in. I said, where am I going, Major? He said, well, I got orders to take you to Third Army Headquarters. So he took me down to... I never did find out who that major was. So I went down to reported in the said Army Headquarters, and it's Captain Cochran. And it was a, I don't know just what his title was at the time. He says, well, I got orders that you're appointed post exchange officer, and we don't have a post exchange. He said, well, go over there to the special service, over that tent over there, and see Colonel Van Buskirk. This is a full term. Colonel Van Buskirk, I knew him out in California in the desert as a captain, and we, we were friends out there, so I went over there and reported in, in to him, and, and uh, he had an assistant, Lieutenant Farrell, First Lieutenant Paul Farrell. So we bumped together, and, and I had nothing to do for a couple of weeks, because we had no post exchange. And then uh, one morning I went up, up for the mess for breakfast. And this Brigadier General Bala was there. I knew him out in California as a lieutenant colonel. <coughs> and you were still a second lieutenant? Yeah, at yeah I was still a second lieutenant. I still hadn't, wasn't able to get promoted. So finally, we got the PX going. And uh, as I say, 
we kept going through France. And, and what's a PX? Post exchange. And what is that? Well, that's why they sell with all of their supplies. And, and uh, so I started out. I think the the first thing we did. This was in the in the fall. They sent a catalog out from E.O. Swass, the toy company in, in New York, and anybody that wanted to send a gift to them, we did it through the catalog for that first Christmas. And then gradually the post exchange built up. And, and uh, of course we were right out in France right where the, all the fighting was going on. We said, we kept going across. And what was Third Army uh, involved in at that point? Everything. Everything. And we were going right across France just as fast as we could go. How did you manage to set up a, a PX? We did it in. I did it in tents. Uh, I did it in every place. And, uh, and we started out real small. I had probably six enlisted men working on me. And I had I had no boss. I, I did whatever I wanted to do, and uh, I think I went into Paris seven days after it was liberated. And uh, gradually we kept going across France, and, and it kept building up. I built a PX up and building it up, and a lot of it's in those letters I was having to Georgery that uh, I wrote home. And, uh, I think we we kept going across France from town to town. We moved every two or three weeks. And then we moved into Nancy, France, late in the fall. And we stayed in Nancy, France all that winter. We were, in, we were in buildings then. We weren't out in tents. We were in buildings. And then uh, I think we were still in Nancy, France at the time of the Battle of the Balls. At the time of the Battle of the Bulge, I was in Paris picking up supplies. I used to go to Paris four days a month for nine months. And uh, then from, from Nancy, France, we moved to Luxembourg. We moved into a little town up in the corner of Luxembourg by the name of Esch, E-S-C-H, I think it was. We stayed there about two weeks. And then we moved to Luxembourg City. And uh, of course, we lived in hotels then, had a mess of the dining room, hotel dining room. And we lived good, Third Army Headquarters. And uh, we, we stayed in uh, Luxembourg for quite a while. Then we moved from there to Munich. And then we, we moved into a big concern there. We were in buildings. I think I was living in an apartment, apartment house at the time. Were these buildings simply abandoned, or did you take them from the office? Uh, a lot of them, they drove the drummer people out of them, just took them over. Now this big apartment building I lived in in Munich, I had a, I had my own room in it. Uh, they had just kicked the people out of them. As a matter of fact, I was reading some of those letters I wrote home the other day telling the same thing. And then... Uh, what I, was a normal day like, actually, trying to run the PX, keep these supply yeah, lines? Yeah, buying supplies and keeping them... As I write in some of those letters, uh, uh, I was busy all the time. As a matter of fact, I, I hated that I wanted to get home. And, uh, I'd write my mother and tell them, this is too much, too much work. Yeah, my mother saved all these letters. And she gave them to me. Here's something I'd like to read, read to you. Please. Uh, we were moving into Munich. And I said, a couple of days ago I walked in on an office to get some information 
And while I was talking to the officer, I looked over at an officer. At another desk. And who do you think it was? Lyman Boynton. He was my scoutmaster. And lived about three houses with me at home. And of all the places in the world yeah. to find him. Yeah. And he and I, he and I stayed pretty close together for quite a while over there. At this point, how long have you been away from your wife? Well, since June 5th, uh, 44. And my daughter, uh, my daughter was six months old when I went overseas. And she's 63 now. How good was the mail at getting to you? Did you often get letters about your wife? Terrible. See if I could tell you something first. about mail all the time. Well, here's what I was going to say. I've just gotten back from a trip to Paris, picked up 60,000 magazines and about 5,500 wristwatches. It was a good trip, wonderful spring weather. Central. Going from here to Paris isn't any different than going from Portsmouth to Boston. Oh, this is a this is what I was trying to tell you in the beginning. Uh, this is the first letter I could write after the war until what we did when we left New York. another thing. It's about a 220 mile trip. It took about seven hours. The road's in bad shape. I took eight ro rolls of movie pictures and lost. I'd lost them all. The PX business is getting bigger and bigger every day. Uh, it, it is what the, I guess I can tell you about when and what I've been doing since I left in June. We left New York on the Queen Mary and arrived in Greenwich, Scotland about the 14th of June. Got on a train and rode overnight, ending up in England around Wells. Stayed there. about a week and then went to Glastonbury. Stayed there for about a month and then went to Southampton where we got the boat for France. Was on the boat about one and a half days crossing the channel. Landed on the beach of France when the invasion started on D-Day. Stopped in Stopped in France, about 20 miles south of Cherbourg. Went from there to around Croutons. Went in swimming off the coast of France, of Croutons. Joined Third Army about the, that time. We went from there to Le Mans, to Pithavier, to Attain. Cologne to Nancy 
France. Stayed in Nancy about three months. And then to Luxembourg. Well, that's about it. I have not left. Yeah. When General Patton and the Third Army were advancing so quickly yeah. across Europe, would, they would avoid large pockets of German resistance, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. So when you would make those long trips to get supplies for the PX, yeah. would you ever come into contact with the No, I never had much controls? trouble. No, I never had any trouble. Now, at the time of the Battle of the Bulge, I was in Paris in the George Fifth Hotel, and they had big mass up on the wall. And they said that the Germans were overrunning us, and you, you couldn't go any place. Well, I, I drove from, with my driver from Paris back to Nancy, France, which is about 220 miles. Never saw anybody. Not a soul? No. Wow. No. But, uh, see, uh, uh, all that stuff that went on. I didn't know too much about because I was in the rear. I was in what they call the rear echelon. I was never in the front. I think the closest I ever got to the front was seven miles one time. But, uh, and a lot of this stuff I read in his books, I had heard about it, but I never knew anything about it. Now, what I'm reading in that book there is all about Patton and Sicily. Well, I had heard about it, but I never knew all the, the facts about it. No. But like. When Patton was in Africa, he was the commander of the Seventh Army, and when he came to France to take over the Third Army, he bought, brought all his special friends, all the section chiefs with him that we had out in California. And uh, when I joined up with him, I was one of the few young ones. Was still with them. Yeah. And I had I had dinner at Patton's house one time out in California. Did you really? Sat right beside him at the table. And why did you have a dinner with him? Well, as I, t I was telling you about this, the time we were flying with the Air Corps, uh, this Captain Galloway was an acting aide to General Patton. And Patton had a house outside of India. His wife was out there. And he had three nieces came to dinner one night and he wanted three officers to come up and, and join him. And this Captain Galloway picked myself and this Lieutenant King. And the three of us went up there. And I was a junior officer, so I ended up sitting next to Patton. And uh, I've told this story for a long time. So we sat there at the meal and uh, I, I talked to him just like we're talking. You weren't nervous at all? Oh, no. And uh, so after we got the end of the dinner, his wife sat down the other end of the table, passed the dessert around, and uh, the gentleman didn't take any of it. He got back to his wife. And she said, Georgie, you didn't eat any dessert. She said, I just made that special for you. He said, well, God damn it, pass it to me. <laughs> so she passed it down and he had the dessert. I, I, I tell the story at every meeting we go to. And uh, at the end of dinner, he got up and accused himself, a little cigar, he had smoked cigars all the time. And then shortly after that we left. What did you think of him after having dinner sitting next to him? Yeah, that's uh, I had no problem with it at all. We, we talked, I don't know what we talked about, but he was very pleasant to me. And, and it's really the first time I'd ever seen him that close up. But I talked to him on the telephone and scars broke down and everything. He knew who I was. But, uh, Did anybody have problems with him? Oh yeah, a lot of people. A lot of, he either hated them or loved them. That, that was a thing. And if you were on his side, you were king. Just like I was telling you about these Colonel that he brought from Africa right up to the 3rd Army headquarters. And, uh, and just, just like with me, uh, after I told you that I talked to that Captain uh, George Mayne, and uh, I figured he was the one that got me back in the 3rd Army. So, oh, a couple months, months later, we were close together. I went up to George 
one day, and I said, I want to thank you, George, for getting me in the said Army. He said, well, don't thank me. He, he said, uh, I told General Gay I was talking to you. And he said, well, go get him. And then we were in Luxembourg, and this Lieutenant King that I'd been in, in the Air Force with, of course, he got out too. He, he couldn't make it. He was up in the Armour Division. And I got a, he come down to see me one day, and he knew General Gay because he was with him out in California. He said, well, let's go up and see General Gay. So I went up to headquarters with him, and I went into General Gay's office and gave him a big salute. I said, General, I want to thank you for bringing me to Third Army. And he said, well, don't thank me. He said, we had a hard time finding you. So if you were on Pat's team, you, you were king. And the same thing, if I go into Paris, uh, I'll, I'll tell you some stories. Uh, because I was close with a special service officer, and they had charge of all these at USO shows that come out. But one time I was going into Paris, and Colonel Ben Musker said to me, he said, we go into a special service officer and find out about this Mickey Rooney show. Mickey Rooney had, had what they call a jeep show. So I went in, and what, what you'll say you're from 3rd Army Headquarters, they fall all over you. And I was only a second lieutenant. So this major, she says, well, come on down to the theater, and we'll see what goes on. So he took me down to the theater, and had Mickey Rooney put that show on, which you see and I sitting there. For just the two of you? Just the two of us. He did the whole show? Yeah, he did the whole show. Wow. So I went back and told Colonel Van Busker, and then Mickey Rooney's show came out to our headquarters. And Mickey Rooney came up to Colonel Van Busker, Van Busker's office, and this Lieutenant Farrell and I were sitting over in the back. And you ought to hear those two go at it. Funniest I ever heard in my life. And of course, being close to the Special Service, they had charge of all these. USO people come over there, and we had everybody. We had uh, Bing Crosby, uh, oh, who knows? I ran post exchange, I ran laundry and dry cleaning. What? You ran the laundry and dry cleaning? And, bar and barber shop. And the barber shop as well? All also. I can pick this around here or something. So, Marlene did had a sweater that she wanted to dry clean. All right. And we were in a little town, I can't remember the town. And before she got it back, we had moved to Frankfurt, which is about 50 miles away. And she demanded that sweater back. I had, to, I had to take a motorcycle and go 50 miles to that dry cleaner to get her sweater back. To deliver her sweater to her. Yep. So what other services did the PX provide? You mentioned laundry and... Yeah, well, we were on the, the, the post exchange itself, then laundry and dry cleaning, and the barber shop. So what were... What did most of the guys want when they came to you as, as the PX officer? Well, we, we had everything. Cigarettes, candy, wristwatches, fountain pens, perfume. I had a, I had a big wall cabinet with two doors on it. And I had that filled with French perfume. All the big brands. Chanel number no. five, Lambert, everything. Yeah. So at one point you took over the entirety of a department store? Yep, yeah, all the whole department store. How happy were the guys to see you standing behind the counter? Every I think it was a dress company that kicked them out. We just took over the building. Over the building. I had the PX on the first floor and I had the uh, laundry and dry cleaning on the second floor. Let me check the signs on those things. I'll tell you what I picked up. How difficult was it to keep regular supply of all the things from wristwatches to perfume to everything else? Yeah. Like moving every couple weeks. It was, a, it was a job, but I had a pretty good crew. Uh, Were there any particular enlisted or other officers that you relied on? Well, I uh, toward the end I had an assistant 
that uh, I had within my company and when I was company commander out in Fort Knox, he was my executive officer. And he was up in a tank company and I got a hold of him and got him transferred to the Third Army Headquarters. Yeah, here's a here's the thing. I am going to open up another branch in a railroad station for combat men going to going on passes. Yeah, here's a here's one here. I have been keeping very busy here as we're moving quite often. I think our next move will be our last for a while. I've seen about as much of Germany as I did of France. We have a good deal of stock in the post exchange at present at present. Just got a shipment of watches in from Switzerland. They are some of the most beautiful ones. I have ever seen. They sell for around fifty dollars. Those are Rolexes um, and some of the other big brands. But would you actually get paid each month? Well, oh. even just a rough amount. I was trying to think. Well, the second town was getting around one hundred and twenty-five, and of course you get extra pay for being overseas. But, uh, well, I used to send two hundred dollars a month home to my wife, so I didn't have. All that much. Yeah, I said these would sell well over a hundred in the states. Now I brought I bought a half a dozen of those back home, and uh, I brought a lady's Rolex home that uh, I gave to my wife, and uh, after she died, I gave to my daughter. And she's got it. I bet that watch is probably worth a couple thousand dollars right now. And you, and you found those watches where? From Switzerland. We got them through the post exchange. Uh, so I have taken over the cleaning and laundry. Uh, no, a laundry and dry cleaning plant. Never. Have crowds running it for me? That's a German. Yeah, I'm glad my mother kept these letters. I had the, I had one time I went into Paris. I took two two and a half ton trucks in there and backed up to a French factory was took six hundred radios back to the troops. French radios. How did your family feel about you being over there? Were they proud? Well, they knew everybody was in the service. Everybody in the service. Even my two brothers were in the navy. They were out in the Pacific, all of them. If you could, what do you recall as a normal day? What time would you get up? What would you eat? Things like that. Just well, a simple, everyday kind of day. I had no set time. I had no set boss. I had no, nobody I had to count to. All the time I was overseas. I ran that PX and nobody ever bothered me. And uh, I just went about. Uh, if I wanted to go to Paris, I just went down, told them, cut me on this, and I was going to Paris for four days. And uh, nobody ever questioned it. Nobody ever questioned it. What was the food like? What, what was uh, sleeping in the tents like? Well, we, we ate good. I, I, I don't know where the letter is, but I got one letter that I wrote here that uh, when we moved into Nancy, France, we moved into buildings. 
and we had an officer of the mess in the hotel restaurant. And the one place I got in here that we had pork chops for lunch, I had steak for dinner. And I remember when we were in Luxembourg, we had ice cream every night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, Third Army headquarters look look good, yeah. but they ran everything. All you had to do was mention you were Third Army headquarters, and boy, they jump all over you. How did things end up towards the end of the war? Well, they didn't end up good for Pat. But uh, I remember. I remember the day the war ended. I don't know where we were. We were some up to some division coming back, and we heard the news. The war was over. We were shooting our forty fives off the side of the jeep. But as I say, I was close to a special service officer, and they control all the movies over there and everything. We did. We have. A movie up in our room at night. Have them come up and bring a projector up there and sit there and have a movie. And I come up going to Paris one time, and it was shortly after Glenn Miller had been lost over the channel, and his orchestra was playing in the theater in Paris. And I sat right in the front seat. Tex Benicky, I think, was the director at that time. Uh, and we had all the movie stars over there. Bob Hope, Mickey, Rooney, Dinah Shore, or you name it. They were all over there. Uh, so where was Third Army's rear echelon when the war ended? Where were you located? I was located in Munich. The forward echelon was down in, in uh, uh, a place called Bad Tolls, about 50 miles south of Munich, and it was more or less a summer resort. And uh, that's back, I can show you. We were over there about eight years ago. This is another book I got. What kind of contact did you have with the German people, or Krauts as you call them? Uh, not very, very good. They were very arrogant. Really? And, yeah, they were very arrogant. Where your brothers were in the Navy, and they were in the Pacific, had you heard anything about the Western aspect of the war? Yeah, they, they used, I used to get letters from them. One of my brothers was on a destroyer, and the other one was on a PT boat. Both on the Pacific. This, this I want to show you. This, this is up at the Battle of the Bowers. This is when we were over there about eight years ago. And this memorial commemorates the Battle of the yeah, Bowers? Yeah. That's up in uh, Bastogne. What recollection do you have of the battle? Hearing about it after the fact, and it's yeah, I, I I didn't know all that much about it. I, I know I hear more now from soldiers that have been there and went through it. It was it was rough, but I was back in the headquarters. I I knew there was a battle going on, but that's about all. I So after you were in Munich and the war was ended, what happened next to you? Trying to get home. Uh, well, to get out, you had to have so many points. Okay. You had, you had to have what they said, thirty-five, eighty-five points. Well, I ended up with eighty-nine, so I got out fairly early, 
And uh, I was friendly with a lieutenant colonel of personnel. And he, he, uh, he told me one day, he said, well, I'm going home with the 3rd Infantry Division. They're going home first. He said, you want to come with me? And I said, yeah, fine. So I had to leave, and I went to Riviera for seven days. And when I come back, I called up Colonel Thomas. And uh, they said, Colonel Thomas isn't here. Where is he? He's gone to 14th Armored Division. So I called up Colonel Thomas on the 14th Armored Division. And he said, I said, how come you're down there? He said, well, I heard they're going home, home first. So I got transferred down there. And he ended up down there, chief of staff to the general. So he said, you want to come? So I got transferred down there, and I took four other men with me. And I come home fairly early. I was home in September, I think, What was it like to come home then? Well, I'm glad to be home. Of course, my daughter was just a year old, a little over a year old. Here's a patent grave. Did your family do anything special to welcome you home? No, I don't recall too much. And I got home. We came into Norfolk, Virginia. And I had to stay there an extra day. Talking about that book, I had to sign all those cards, cards with the shot on them for all the troops. I sat there one whole night just initialing all those cards. And then I came up to Fort Devons. From there, I don't know how much leave I had. I had quite a bit of leave coming. But then, uh, I was glad to be home. I was glad to be home. After you got home, what did the future look like for you? Well, I didn't do too much for a while. I had. I was still getting paid for two or three more months, so I did. I just had a good time. My wife and I traveling, going where we wanted to go. And then I finally decided that her father was a salesman of the Donut Corporation of America, and he used to go around calling, calling on donut shops. As a matter of fact. You got a neighbor over there in Glastonbury, Jack, Jack Lemon's son. Jack Lemon's father was my father-in-law's boss. Really? Yeah. And a matter of fact, I, I told you about those wristwatches I brought home. Sure did. Her father-in-law wanted one of them to get to Jack Lemon's father. Someday I want to go over there and talk to his, his grandson. I've been going to write them, but I never have. But, uh, my, my wife knew the lemons quite well. And then finally, my wife's father talked me into buying a donut shop in Newburyport, Mass. So that's what I, where I ended up doing. And I, I ran that for a long time. And when I came to Connecticut, I came down here with Dunkin' Donuts. I managed that donut shop on the Main Street in East Hartford. And also on the Albany Avenue, it's gone now. Yeah. Must have been uh, a little bit of the same and a whole lot of different to run a donut shop yeah. instead of a PX. Yeah, it, it, it was. It was. And I did that for quite a while. But I, I was over there in East Hartford today and went by that donut shop. And I got thinking, I said, it's been 41 years since I managed that donut shop. And he said, yeah. yeah, I've been down in Connecticut here since 1960. 
I've been right here for 21 years. Do you think your military experience has influenced you much? Yeah, I learned a lot because I, I could travel a lot, which I enjoyed. And even going back over there eight years ago, we travel the same, same places. Are you associated with uh, the VFW or any of the other veterans organizations? Yeah, I, uh, I, bl I belong to the VFW for probably 10 or 12 years in Plainville and never went to a meeting. And I finally transferred up here two years ago. And uh, this post is very active up here, very good post. And I belong to the American Legion. I haven't attended any meetings there either. But shortly after, after I got home, I don't know how long it was, I finally joined the reserves in Massachusetts. And that, that's when I got my promotion to captain. Well, I got promoted overseas as first lieutenant, finally. But uh, when I went in the reserve, I got promoted to captain. And I stayed in the reserve until I moved down here. Is there anything else that you'd like to touch on specifically? No, the, not too much I can say about now. Is it? thing is, they're all dying off. We used to have that, as I said, we used to have that uh, reunion every year, that and staff. And up until two years ago, and they, everybody did the wall. Most of them are older than I am. All the more important that we capture this history while we can. Yeah. Well, that's why I try to Right down as much as I can. And who was, uh, it was George, what was his name? George England. So George England was here observing. I'm Shane Matthews. I was the interviewer today. And I'd like to thank you, Robert Gamble, very much for uh, telling your story to us today. And anything I can help you with, just let me know.